am Amy Vetter, and welcome to the Breaking Beliefs Podcast. This valuable time is for you to pause in your day and go on your own self journey. Discover the beliefs that are holding you back from living your best life at work and at home. Learn from the guests on this show as they share their inspirational stories on how they found ways to break internal beliefs that were no longer serving them. Because if you believe you can, you will. And our podcast begins now. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs, where I interview Dino Confalone. He is the 2021 president of the Greater Boston Association of Realtors and 2022 national director. Dino is a realtor and leverages three decades of corporate and real estate experience to deliver leadership, knowledge, and value. His professionalism and moral compass has set him apart. Clients describe him as calming and trustworthy. He is a top producer with Sotheby's Network. He delivers a high-level production with a small company feel. He is a Suffolk University graduate and is partnered with organizations such as Harvard, MIT, PwC, and Arnold Worldwide. During this interview, we discuss his upbringing with his immigrant grandparents and his parents and how that affected the person he is today. Dino will share his tips on pivoting your life and utilizing the experience you have to create the success you desire. I hope you enjoy this interview with Dino. Like, share, and subscribe to this podcast so more people are able to gain from the advice of my guests as well. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs, where I'm with Dino Confalone. He is a realtor and the immediate past president of the Greater Boston Association of Realtors. So Dino, do you want to go ahead and give a little brief background before we get into your story? Sure, Amy. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited. Um, As you mentioned, I'm the uh, immediate past president for the Boston Association of Realtors. And, uh, you know, last year during my presidency, my biggest thing was health and wellness and really trying to just be happy with what you're know the situation you're in um, my background is basically I'm a recovering accountant like yourself um, <laughs> went down a path that I thought I was supposed to do um, first generation Italian American my parents are from Italy you know being the good boy and doing what I had to do and then realized that I just wasn't happy um, and now I'm in real estate and uh, just going past a decade and really have just kind of started to shine in this industry um, and it reflects, you know, the fact that I was president last year and I'm um, a national association director now. So I'm, I'm actually really happy kind of setting myself up in, in a nice groove. Um, and that's where we are today. Awesome. Well, so to get uh, started today, let's start from the beginning. And I um, would love to hear a little background since your parents are immigrants um, and just about your upbringing there. When did they come over to America? And what's that story? So um, my my parents are from Abruzzi, which is um, like in the mountains. I, I refer to myself as like a redneck Italian because they were from the <laughs> mountains. And so my, my grandfathers were on both, my mother's father and my father's father were very good friends in this really small town. Um, And I think it was kind of like, you know, they connected them, if you will. Okay. (laughs) So uh, they came here in the late 60s. And, uh, you know, real estate was what my dad really kind of took on and and started to shine with. So he became, um, you know, came here with nothing, basically, and had like three jobs, total stereotype, you know, working in a warehouse, you know, and all this stuff. But he really did um, a lot with the what he had very proud of him. And his work ethic was just, you know, phenomenal. So why did they decide to come to America? Opportunity, land of opportunity. So I think they both, you know, just their parents, you know, were, were very adamant about them having an opportunity and just not looking back. I was in that time. I think that's pretty much the goal. A lot of people were looking at America as the land of opportunity. Yeah. So, uh, so he, was working three jobs and you said he got into real estate. So when did that yeah. happen and why? So that's actually a little, um, an interesting story. 
So um, in the Boston area, big, um, you know, before Macy's, it was Jordan Marsh. And so uh-huh. my dad actually got a job in the warehouse of Jordan Marsh and worked there for 20 years. Like he was part of like the Teamsters union, if you will, you know? Okay. And uh, so, you know, I'm growing up and I'm off to college. And so my dad ends up getting laid off from his job. You know, he was doing other jobs as well, like cleaning floors, you know, we were just very stereotypical. Um, and I was a freshman at the time and he's like, out of a job. What am I going to do? Um, but he had invested in real estate in the seventies. So he was, and I, I basically said to him, I'm like, why don't you just get your real estate license? And this was in 1990, um, when I was a freshman in college and he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really good with tests. You know, he didn't really excel at school. So I had a test with him. I actually studied. It was like a really strong bonding experience between oh, the two of us. That's cool. Um, so we both got well, our licenses in 1991. And uh, <laughs> I finished college and went off into accounting. And he really excelled um, and became like an award winner um, on the South Shore of Boston as a real estate agent. Um, so oh, it was actually cool. a really cute story and really, you know, bonded us. Yeah, that that's, that's a really cool story. So, um, so before we go, further into you being an accountant what about your mom <laughs> what did she, what did she do so i think that's where i got my accounting from so she's very financial minded and uh so she was working when she came here she basically got a job at state street bank you know in like that type of role um and she worked there for probably 25 years as well so it's something that, you know back in the day there was a lot of years and years and commitment to these companies which is so different now <laughs> i know right totally yeah. Uh, and then when you were little, so really kind of seeing your parents struggle, being immigrants. Um, and let me just ask, were your grandparents here? Or were you guys kind of a, alone or did you have a bigger immigrant community? Yeah. So I'm from Quincy, Quincy, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, it was definitely a bigger Irish community, um, you know, and probably I would say like 25% of Italian, but it was pretty big. Um, the neighborhood that we lived in did was a mix of people. Um, my it was total stereotypical. We lived in a you know a three family house, and my grandparents lived upstairs for me. So I was they were very important in part of my life for many years. They didn't speak English. They didn't drive a car. So you know pretty much we were responsible for making sure they got to their doctor's appointments or to the supermarket. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, it was actually a very a great way to to, to grow up um, with the family all around each other. And I named my kids after my grandfather. So oh, okay. um, I got to know them and like, they're just a really big part of my family and I, and I miss them big time. Now, so you speak Italian? I do. Okay. So, uh, so what did you learn from your grandparents younger? So, I mean, I, my parents were working so much, you know, and my grandparents kind of raised me a little bit, if you will, even mm-hmm. though we we're all together. Um, but, you know, my grandparents taught me empathy and really just to be a good person. They were just like amazing. I, I, um, I couldn't even imagine my life without them. And my wife actually was lucky to meet them as well. We've been together a long time. So she really, um, even though my grandparents didn't speak English, uh, they thought they did. So they would communicate with her all the time and she would just smile and nod her head. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I learned a lot about like, they, they taught me empathy, how to care for others and um, just to be a good person. Strong work mm-hmm. ethic too. So, uh, when so seeing all this, so you've seen them take risks, coming to another country, everyone supporting each other, um, and so forth. As a child, what was it that you imagined yourself when you grew up? Like, what was what were the things that that you dreamt about? Well, so um, you know, Italian guilt. So I went to Catholic school. I was a Catholic school boy, an altar boy. And so my life was going to be basically, a, you know, part of the family. So I remember joking with my grandmother when I graduated from college. I'm like thinking about moving to New York City just to have some fun. And she's like, you can't do that to me. Like, How can you do that to you? You're not going anywhere. You're staying here. So like I always thought about just, you know, I don't know, you know, becoming um, some sort of financial manager and, you know, having a family and being close to home. That was pretty much like embedded in my brain from the time I was growing up. Yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah. So when you were going to college then, so since you were thinking about being a financial manager, is that why you chose accounting or 
How did actually, you end up in accounting? The, I chose accounting because my mother told me to. <laughs> <laughs> and what was her reason for that? She just thought, you know, get a business degree. And then so, you know, I, I went to Suffolk University. So it was like what, you know, I tested the various subject matter. And like, I think accounting is kind of where I was, I was good at. And I think, you know, it is kind of funny how my mother was definitely good with numbers. So mm -hmm. and now I notice my 15 uh, year old is really good with numbers. So it just kind of becomes genetic to some degree. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So you're in accounting, you're getting a real estate license with your dad. So were you starting to see you were interested in real estate then, or it was really just about your dad and you finishing accounting at that point? Yeah, really just to kind of help him out. Yeah. So it didn't really like, yeah, I would say it was pretty point. much just to help him. Okay. Yeah. So, so where did you end up working after you graduated? So I went to state street bank <laughs> and okay. I, didn't, I didn't really do accounting, which was kind of funny. And I, I just, I, at that point I was starting to think that I didn't really like it, even though I was good at it. So it was weird. I kind of had like an in and out, like I ended up going to PricewaterhouseCoopers after um, when I was a little bit older and I went in as like a senior manager, I'm not on the CF, um, the partner track, but like, I just, again, I think I was always fighting and resisting it. Um, I don't know. I just, I felt like I just, I am, I'm extremely like my dad definitely is more personable and salesy and like, I'm not, I'm a realtor now. So it's like, I just don't want to be like sitting in an office like for eight hours a day. And I think that's just, I, I always like fought it. So when I ended up becoming a senior manager, like a CFO, my a hundred percent focus was making sure I was meeting with clients and, you know, doing the social component, taking people to lunch <laughs> and all the inner yeah. office stuff. I would just love her. I just like not do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let someone else do it. Yeah. So what spawned you to then make this pivot or change into real estate? So my company, um, so I was the CFO of a 50 person public relations firm. That was like the pinnacle of where my career was. Um, and it was just literally like I'd been there seven years and then all of a sudden 2008, boom, like it was like the financial collapse. We had millions of dollars in receivables, outstanding receivables. And I'm like laying people off. It was miserable. I literally had like a box of tissues on my desk as I was laying people off, you know, and it just, it really screwed up my insides. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I had a baby and then I had a cancer scare. Like there was just a huge amount of things going on between, I would say like 2007 to 2009 was very um, life awakening, if you will, and really appreciating my life and trying to figure out what made me happy. Um, mm -hmm. And so my license was all, my real estate license was always active. I just never really thought about it. But then, you know, as people were moving around, my you know, one of my friends was going to sell his house in the South end of Boston, which is like a really hot neighborhood. And it was my first listing. Um, it was like $1.2 million. And I absolutely loved the process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did like a broker open house and it was like social, the whole thing just kind of, I was just like, I can't even believe I hadn't been doing this. Like I loved this. And that really was pushed me over the edge. So then I held on to um, like doing that type of work, you know, accounting work. So then I ended up becoming a consultant. I went to Harvard, tried to do the consulting thing, just kept realizing that this is not what I want to do. So there was a couple of years. There was like, I would say two or three years that I held on and I just couldn't let go of it until maybe mm. I finally let go in like 2012. So, you know, I, I've interviewed other salespeople and real estate professionals on this podcast and especially um, in real estate, um, just hearing the struggle of um, the selling process and the rejection and, and so forth. So, you know, you kind of, I, well, first off, I'm wondering, you know, to make that transition and that leap, you kind of guided your father to do that, um, you know, while you're in college. So did you summon that back up when, you um, you were making this change, like what went through the process of taking the risk and not being scared to do it? To some degree, it was support from my wife. You know, I know she was more of like, why don't you just try to like take a lesser position you know, in a financial capacity. Um, but I noticed that I was actually really good at it and met a lot of people over the way, over the years. 
And it really is about networking and referrals. And, and I was noticing that people definitely, they, a lot of my business was people that knew me from my previous life and they trusted me. And so when I was getting into those, like they were starting to refer me. So my referral base really started to blow up. And I just said, you know what? I really think I need to try, I need to do this. And my wife noticed how happy it made me. So she, and she, you know, after everything we'd gone through the previous years, I think it really kind of solidified our relationship too. And I think it was like, it was a team effort. Um, and she, she works at Harvard university. She's an HR. Um, so, you know, I did, I was lucky that I had that stability. I was on her medical insurance, you know, stuff like that. So we definitely looked at it from a team perspective. Um, and she knew it was going to be a little while to get me up and running, but I mean, I really haven't looked back. It's been amazing. Yeah. And, and I think that is really important, um, in any career changes or starting a new business or sales, uh, or whatever your career is, honestly, is to have that communication with the people around you for support, um, when you're going about doing it, because the problem is when you don't have that support, then you feel guilty or you might not, you know, you knew you could put in the time because she understood, but you were communicating, um, which is such an important lesson um, in anybody's career that we can't always go it alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so as far as like getting started, so you had this referral base, but still sales are sales. So um, what were you able to take from either other generations that you saw or your own lessons in your career to help you to be successful in this? So right out of the, right out of the gate, you know, there's just like a ton of hours, you know, and from my previous life, I knew that, you know, you had to put the time, the hours into, um, but for the first few years, it was stressful, you know, trying to get through financially, but I felt like I was starting to get into that groove again of overworking and too much and like taking away from the family. Um, and then after, you know, that two year mark, I was like, you know what, I need to redefine how I do this. So I started taking a lot of time back for myself and my family, like shutting my phone off at dinner. Um, you know, take, I, I still try not to work on Saturdays. It's like soccer day for my kids. Um, or just like hanging out, going to a movie. So that really kind of made me step back and realize that, you know, work-life balance still needs to be part of my life, no matter what, no matter how stressed I am, if a deal falls apart, it's going to, there's going to be another one. So that's why mm -hmm. I mentally, I really was able to get, um, you know, through the tough times and just making sure that understanding what's important in my life and just sticking with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as far as like, when you say a deal doesn't go through, um, what did you learn about how to make sure a deal goes through? So one thing I learned from PwC is how to fire clients and, uh, <laughs> terminate clients. And uh, that's like one of them of the biggest takeaways that I, have taken with me from a previous life. And it's amazing when there are toxic people or toxic clients that are just really bringing you down. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I, that is one of the biggest things that I've done to really have, help me get through. Um, and I, I just, I don't need to work with toxic people that don't respect me or, you know, value what we do. And that really has changed my life. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, did you kind of centralize on a certain market or a niche or were you more of a generalist? Um, well, I do. I mean, I'm residential. I'm a residential realtor that does, you know, single families, condos, multifamilies. And I, my office is based out of Cambridge because of my connection with Harvard and MIT, even though I live in the suburbs um, of Boston. But I think, you know, I, I do have kids to feed. So I will go like with it. There's a couple of roads in the Boston area, Route 128, Route 490, 495 that circle the city of Boston. Um, and, you know, I look at the map and I try to, I, I, I'm really familiar. I grew up in the area. So I try to really focus on like within a certain um, parameter, if you will, just so I can be that expert. Mm -hmm. um, and I do work for Sotheby's. So what I've done is I was able to like refer people out to other markets that I'm not necessarily comfortable in. And it does come across really positively with clients that know that I'm not trying to stretch um, and I'm able to get someone good. So yeah, that's kind of 
you know, I'm not, I'm not far from my office. I mean, it depends on the, the traffic, but um, that's pretty much how I focus my business. So was there anything that you went to your father about as you started going into this to ask for advice or what he might've told you getting into this profession? Yeah. I mean, it really is about connections and, you know, over the years, over the decades, if you will, he's really been able to establish himself um, with a great deal of respect. And that's one thing I noticed is when I did start getting and dipping my toe back into the market or into the real estate community, um, when they were like, Hey, aren't you Gus, Gus's son? You know, that would like make me feel warm and fuzzy because there are uh-huh. like, Oh my God, he's such a great guy. I've had a couple of deals with him. Um, but you know, he's in the suburbs and I was in the city. So we, we were not together for pretty much the whole time, like since 2008, when I started getting more involved in real estate. Um, but this just last month, he decided to join Sotheby's with me. Um, Uh-oh. so we did, we created a team after all these years, which oh, is really wow. funny. I know, I know it's great. He's 74. Um, <laughs> and like, he's got so many connections, but he's just, I don't know. I think it's more of like a comfort thing. And, uh, so I'm just really happy to have him like in the family now. So how will that change how you go about, um, doing what you do now that it's kind of a family business? Um, I don't think it's going to change anything really. I think we just continue on the path of just making those connections and just, just doing what we do, you know? And I think it's just like, he's sitting on the South shore in an office and I'm sitting in Cambridge, but we basically are able to now like expand our footprint, if you will. Yeah. So, you know, so I've been talking to the greater Boston association of realtors for a while now, because, um, you guys first reached out when it was COVID and, you know, things have kept changing with the conference and so forth. Uh, what, you know, have you seen as struggles of people just, taking care of their wellness, um, through this time, especially in your profession and, um, how you've been able to, to demonstrate doing that, um, for the members of that association. So, I mean, it was tough, I have to admit. And, you know, during the lockdown, um, you know, this is, this is our lives. Like people have to, they still have to move. (laughs) There's still situations that people are going to have to move. Uh, During the lockdown, being part of the association was significant because we were able to work with our government agencies and create. um, So we were essential, which was phenomenal because we had transactions that still had to like move forward and close. Um, But so that's one of the reasons I joined the board and became president last year is the amount of um, impact we're able to have on our community. So we were able to do little things like, I mean, the big thing of making us essential, but also like work with the fire department. So the fire department has to come and visit and certify the smoke inspectors for every sale. We were able to get a waiver because, you know, people didn't want the fire department coming into their apartments. (laughs) So it was like everything, you know, there were challenges. So the thing is, I feel like I've made myself better as a practitioner on the ground by being that high level person and making an impact on the industry. And that kind of flows through to my clients and they see how, I'm able to impact their lives, but also that I'm part of the overall community. Right. And, and I know from, you know, it, it appears from a lot of um, real estate professionals, you know, from the outside, it looked like, you know, oh my gosh, they're making tons of money right now. There's, you know, so many houses going up for sale and the prices are the highest they've ever been. Uh, And through, you know, the different associations I've spoken to and, and so forth. I think, you know, what looks like from the outside is on the inside has been a really hard work-life balance and also actually being successful in that environment. So what were some of the things that, that you were seeing out there? So, I mean, it is, it's a brutal market. Um, you know, it's been really, really hard. I have to say the last few months alone, have been, it's just like the lowest inventory we ever had and the highest demand. So it's just, it's, it's a very tough, tough situation we're in. Um, last year during my presidency, that was like, we did see, you know, there's definitely depression. People are really just frustrated. They're afraid. 
Um, but what we did from an association perspective is really we tried to just accommodate by doing as many Zoom calls as we could. Um, and then, you know, as things progressed, we were dipping our toe in, trying to figure out, do you want to come back in person? You know, and just like offering those things. We did a lot of educational series last year. Um, we wanted you to come on board, <laughs> which I'm yeah. psyched that you're coming um, to our roadshow. But I feel like, you know, just having from an association perspective, you know, letting our, our, our members know that we're there for them and we, you know, whatever it takes, we'll try to help you. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really important um, thing for all people to realize is not everything is the way it seems. And there's so many people, whether they're salespeople or entrepreneurs or whatever it is um, with the world changing it, change everything. I mean, for me personally, I just had to close my yoga business this past weekend. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So that, um, again, people don't realize, you know, all the behind the scenes that you're just trying to struggle and keep things going, um, with things that you can't control and same thing for salespeople and people that are depend like don't have confirmed salaries or maybe lost their jobs during this time. Uh, you know, as well, uh, is how you still keep that mindfulness, that wellness in your life. Um, because depression is real and it, it, you know, it, these are all tools that we have within us to try to help, um, keep us at equilibrium when things like this are happening. So what kind of things were you doing yourself, um, to manage your stress or depression levels during that? So I have two children, two boys, 11 and 15. So I do, I, I just try to make sure that they see a certain, how things are going with us. Um, and I've noticed that, you know, they, they're striving, they're doing really well. Thankfully, you know, they could bog themselves down into depression, especially when they were doing like hybrid learning and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, at the end of the day, I shut my phone off for dinner. I want to make sure that we're present. I asked both of them to tell me something good about what happened today in their lives. Um, that's one of the biggest things I've noticed. I've been doing that for years now. Um, and it really just kind of centers us and puts us together. Unfortunately, the TV is on sometimes. Um, sometimes I have to turn it off or put the mute button on, but it really does come to like, come down to like centering yourself in your life. Um, if you don't have kids, I don't know, use a pet or work out or something. But for me personally, I feel like that is like, guarded time. I really kind of defend that time. Um, mm -hmm. just like not wanting on, not wanting to work on Saturdays and which is you know, big I'm, in your field to not work on Saturdays. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, I mean, I think as I was leading into, um, leadership at the association, one thing that I decided was I was going to hire an assistant and I was going to make sure that again, I was going to make that, I was going to guard my calendar and really just hyper-focus on if a client wants to be out on Saturday, they're going to have to go with my assistant. There's mm -hmm. no, there's no messing around. I mean, and, and I'm fully just, I full disclosure to all my clients and this is the world that I'm in. And I've noticed that they respect it tremendously because they wish they had it in their lives. But <clears throat> that's why the clients that don't respect me or respect my time, I don't have time to work with them. I'll be glad to refer them to someone else, but that is, that has been so instrumental in my life. And I think that others need to look at that as well. Yeah. And just being transparent that it's not personal. This is, this is what I do in my life. And if you want to work with me, just to know that that upfront communication is important. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, what I'd like to do is just, uh, I ask a few rapid fire questions at the end. Um, and you pick a category, the category is either family and friends, money, spiritual, or health. So you can choose one of those. Uh, let's do money. Okay. Um, things or actions that I don't have that I want with money. Um, I would like to continue to refocus on my business um, more so than I have because I kind of took some time off with the association. Um, and that's really what I want to, I want to get to that point and really start to invest back into my business and get myself to another level. Okay, great. Things are actions that I do have that I want to keep as far as money. Um, so guarding my calendar, guarding my schedule, 
And I think that will contribute to being able to really spread my business out even more. Okay. Things or actions that I don't have that I don't want. <laughs> um, I don't want toxic people in my life. Um, <laughs> they do sprinkle in, and yes. I, but then I end up terminating those relationships. So I just don't want that. And I want that to continue, continue to flow through me and out of me. Yeah. Be able to catch it early. Right? Yes. Oh my God. Calls you. Yeah. That's a tough one. Sometimes you're just like, you hold on too long and you're like, damn yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Things or actions that I do have that I don't want as far as money. Um, I think what I do have is I do have the luxury of like doing vacations and so forth. What I don't want is to stop or like not go on vacation. Cause that's something that I notice a lot of people they just go too long and they don't schedule vacation in their time. So I right. don't want to do that. Okay, great. So is there anything that you want to share with the listeners that we didn't go over today or some takeaway that you want to make sure people have walking away from this conversation? I think they just have to continue to add mindful, be mindful of their business. And I think your book does a good job of that, of really just kind of making sure that you're aware of what you're doing. Um, and one thing that I did last year, um, so I did a video every month. It was called the monthly minute. And it would, we would just communicate with our membership. Um, and I would, at the very end, I would just say, um, just be nicer to each other. Like, that's one of the biggest things. And I like, be empathetic. Don't immediately snap at someone. We're all in this together. We got to get through this together. Um, but really just be nicer to each other. Yeah, very nice. Well, thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation today. And I'm sure the listeners will be able to take a lot of uh, actions from this in their own lives. Thank, thank you. you so much, Amy. I'm looking forward to meeting you on Thursday. Me too. <laughs> All right. And now for my mindful moments, just of my takeaways from this interview that I had with Dino that I think all of us should highlight in our own lives and maybe step back Take some moments to reflect on your own history and the people that have affected you to see how you're utilizing those lessons today. And the reason that I say that is because during this interview, you could see how much effect in Dino's life that he's had from his parents and his grandparents of watching them and being a part of their lives which I think is so important to understand in our own lives, the effect we have on the people around us that we might not even realize. And that's younger generations, that's people that are our peers and so forth. So we talked about his family being immigrants and living with his grandparents and his parents and how he uh, really worked with his father as his father decided to move into the real estate industry after years and years of working hard labor jobs, helping him get through college. And Dino really giving back to his father when he made this choice to pivot his career and his life to real estate, where he helped study with him and get his real estate license as well. Little did he know he would be using that later. And his financial side, coming from his mother, who worked in a bank for 25 years, this really shaped the person that Dino became and what career he chose by becoming an accountant and a CPA, but also really keeping up with what his father was doing along the way and the success that was working out for his father in the real estate industry. The other people that were definitely very influential from the conversation that I had from, with him were his grandparents. And I thought it was really interesting how he's melded the work experience that he saw from his father and his mother and the compassion and empathy lessons that he received from his grandparents growing up and how that's molded him into the professional and how he works with clients and the people around him. So we talked about the fact that he really went on this path of being an accountant and had a very successful career 
but at a certain point decided that he really wanted to make a pivot into his life so that he could be working more with clients rather than behind a computer. And we all have these moments in our life where there's a change, not really anything we know is coming for us, but whatever it is that opened our eyes to that change, really taking a step back and pausing in those moments rather than really forcing yourself to keep moving forward and going against your gut or your intuition of your body sending you messages that something's just off. And another really important point here was that he got support from his wife to make this change, that she trusted him, she trusted in his skills, and that also helped him to have the confidence to really make this shift and pivot into the real estate industry from being a CFO. Now, some of the lessons that he learned along the way that I think are really important as we go into whether it's a new career, whether we're experienced in our career or whatever it may be, is really setting boundaries. And he really talked about boundaries in a couple ways. One being not overworking because that can easily happen as we're trying to be successful, but then it cuts into our family life, our personal life, And we really realize how much that really matters in the end, where work may go away, but if we're not present for the people around us, it can really affect us, not only emotionally, but sometimes health-wise as well. So a very important boundary that he put in place, which is very hard in the real estate industry, was not working on Saturdays. And I would say also in the accounting profession, This also runs the same gamut of working long hours on the weekends as well. So really thinking about how you can set those boundaries, still accomplish what you need to accomplish, which really led to the second lesson is firing the clients that are toxic, that are not people that you should be working with, that they don't appreciate the value that that you're creating for them, the time that you're creating with them and also really deciding what kind of relationships you want to have with your clients and if people do not fit that criteria and it's important to write down what that criteria is really what it does is make you unhappy with the work that you're doing and no person's really worth that Uh, it's important that we fill our life with people that are not toxic and that contribute in a positive way. So the third lesson that he had really came from his father and it was all about connections and relationships and that people need to respect you and spending time with people so that they know you care. And so I think this is a really important lesson when we do decide the people we wanna work with, we also decide how we wanna show up for those people making sure that we set the right time aside so that they feel that they matter, that you care, and that you're there to support them. So some ways that he's been able to set these boundaries is at a meal, at dinner, when he's with his family, making sure that he has shut his phone down and also asking the people around him to shut their phone down, the TV down, and really have conversation and to get to know one another and see what's happening in each other's day and how you can be there to support your family as well. And then also making sure that you've got your time guarded and how you're going to use that time is very intentional and making sure that you center your activities and um, relationships and clients and all those types of things. You prioritize where they work best in your day, but it's a non-negotiable that, you know, unless it is a, a complete fire drill, most things can wait as long as you let people know when you will be able to get to it. So it's really important as we walk away from this conversation is to realize how important 
relationships are, whether that's in business, whether that's our family or our friends, and that we're making time for it, that we're showing up for the people around us that we're caring. And that pays off in ways that we might not even realize when we are setting that time aside or wasn't our intention in the first place. But people know that you care. And that is the most important thing is how someone walks away from you, that it isn't about what you said or what you did. It's how you make those people feel and how you make yourself feel in the end as well. So I hope you share, you enjoyed this podcast interview with Dino and that you were able to take away some lessons that you can think about of how to incorporate in your day. Please share, like, subscribe to this podcast. Also, a new benefit that I have for my B3 Method members is live virtual yoga and meditation and mindfulness classes every single day. So there are recorded library of classes, not only on mindfulness content, but also for uh, yoga and mindfulness classes that have been live are on the recorded library as well. So this is all $29.95 a month. You can join for 30 days free for listening to this podcast. Just put in the code B3FREE and try it out if you go to businessbalancebliss.com. I hope to virtually see you there. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Breaking Beliefs podcast. I hope you will take a moment to pause before entering back into your day to reflect on this podcast and note one to two actions you are inspired to do from today's conversation that you could incorporate into your life. To read the full blog and listen back to this episode or any other, you can find them at www.amyvetter.com forward slash breaking beliefs podcast and related videos on my YouTube channel. For daily inspiration, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Amy Vetter CPA. I hope that you will choose to like this and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and more so that you can join us for more inspiration on our next episode.